uh, in Stockholm. Uh, so most of the restaurants, so all these nice restaurants uh, we, uh, where we went during summer workshops, they are all closed now essentially. So there are not so many, not so many options uh, for nice dining uh, uh, around this area. And also for, there are a few options for lunches. And so the lunches will be organized as follows. Uh, so there will me, Andy, and today Mats Valin we will uh, uh, take, uh, so we, we can split in three groups and each of us, so I will take uh, 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 people to Greek restaurant it, uh, it, uh, for, for lunch it has a mixture of Mediterranean and local Swedish cuisine, so stand minus walk. Uh, so Andy uh, will take people to Thai place if someone likes Thai. Thai food, so you, and uh, Mats will take people to Indian uh, in Indian restaurant. So just in this lunch break, just for all of uh, uh, one of us, uh, depending on what cuisine we prefer. So spread out a bit. <laughs> <laughs> so so this is uh, because of also there is usually there is a lunch place. Uh, in this building, which is quite nice, but uh, this week it is closed. Uh, so there will be uh, a conference dinner on the fifth, and uh, uh, it will be also uh, in the Greek restaurant. Uh, so. Uh, so as for. You, so as for internet, so as for other practical methods, internet access, uh, you, you probably got all the uh, internet access cards uh, during the registration. And uh, so, any, so, uh, so any other questions on uh, any practical methods or did, did you have uh, uh, complete information from Hans Millen and uh, so is everything? Uh, So then, uh, uh, maybe we can. Uh, is, there was a, a conciliation, uh, a short noise conciliation this morning. Uh, 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 Boris and Schuller could not come for family reasons. I uh, got message from him only this morning. So maybe we can uh, uh, start. Uh, a bit earlier and have less uh, uh, time pressure, so maybe we uh, maybe, uh, in the, in the morning sessions, uh, if you need uh, five minutes to ten minutes more, so we have, uh, we have extra time. So, so uh, the, first, the first speaker will be Siri uh, Shimachi uh, from uh, Geneva University. Well, thank you very much for, for coming uh, uh, to our conference. Thank you. So while I'm plugging the computer again, let me thank the organizers for uh, inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be uh, in Stockholm and in Nordita in its new incarnation. I've been in Nordita in uh, Denmark, but I've never been uh, here, so now let's see if it starts. There is no signal. Yes, it's there. Okay, now it should start. And <coughs> yes, and I would like to, uh, well, I would like to tell you something, but the computer doesn't like it, so we'll see if it goes back. Let's see. No? Yes. Yes, okay. I hope it will stay there. So the best resolution is 1200. Okay, so I can change the resolution, but uh, le let's leave it that way for the moment. Okay, so I wanted to tell you about some uh, recent work, but uh, as you will see, which, is, uh, which has sort of ancient history on uh, spin divers, on uh, quantum magnetism. And I want to show you that this touches with uh, several uh, other fields 
that you will hear later today, uh, namely Bosenstein condensation and also uh, one-dimensional systems, and we'll come uh, back to that. So uh, before I start with, uh, with the work itself, uh, let me um, uh, give you the, the people who did the, the real work uh, in, the, in this uh, work. Most of the work was done by uh, Pierre Bouillot, who is a graduate student in my group, and this was with uh, strong collaborations with Corinne Accolat. Uh, it started when she was a postdoc in, in, in my group, and now she's uh, in Ecole Polytechnique uh, in Paris, and she should soon uh, join us in Geneva as a faculty, uh, faculty member. Uh, Andreas Loichli, who is in Dresden, Michel Zvonarev, who is now in Paris, and uh, Roberta Chitro and Edmond Rignac, respectively, in Salerno and uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure in New York. And we have a uh, very, very nice collaboration with two experimental groups you will see uh, later in the, in the talk. One is the group of Claude Berthier for NMR in Grenoble, and one is the group of Christian Rueck, uh, who was then in the London Center for Nanotechnology and is now uh, in PSI uh, in Zurich, uh, close to Zurich in, in Switzerland. Okay, so what is it about? Well, you all know uh, about quantum magnetism, uh, and you know that if you have strong repulsion between uh, fermions, between particles, and if you have a lattice, then you have a phase which is called a Mott insulator, which was discovered a long time ago by Sir Neville Mott, where you get one particle per site, the fermions localize on each side of the lattice, and they cannot move, the charge cannot move, otherwise you have to pay an extremely large uh, Coulomb repulsion, but what is extremely interesting is that the spin degrees of freedom of the fermions remain, so uh, you have a phenomenon known as super exchange, namely the particle can still hop virtually between the sides of the lattice, and as a result you end up with something where you have a spin one half on each side, and essentially the spin one half interact by uh, an Hamiltonian, which is an Heisenberg Hamiltonian, uh, which I've written here, and the super exchange, which was uh, introduced a long time ago, in particular by Phil Anderson, is uh, mostly antiferromagnetic, so it wants two neighboring spins to point anti-parallel uh, to each other. And so you have a very interesting branch of physics, which is called quantum magnetism, uh, which consists in essentially solving this Hamiltonian on various geometries, various lattices, and this leads to highly non-trivial physics and phases, and I'm sure you will hear uh, about uh, several of these uh, phases in the various talks uh, later in the conference. Uh, but <clears throat> essentially, uh, this is what I want to talk, in, uh, about, talk to you about, and I want to talk to you about a system which has no charge degrees of freedom. The charge degrees of freedom is completely frozen, and only this spin degrees of freedom, this uh, sometimes people now call a spin one half a qubit, so if you're so inclined, you can decide you want to call it a system of qubits, Excuse but me. I will stick to the... Excuse me, yes? can you uh, explain my <coughs> little question? Why call it super exchange, but not simple exchange? Well, okay, so uh, the name is historical, I, I will not... Uh, the exchange is the same. Yeah, yeah it's the, natu the normal exchange would be the same between two spins, I think the reason why it was called super exchange, maybe Phil wanted it to call it super because it sounds better, uh, but, uh, but essentially this is an exchange which has its origin in the interplay between kinetic energy and repulsion. So okay, the direct, it's, it's, it's an exchange. Okay. Uh, I think it's called super exchange to just distinguish it from the direct dipole-dipole exchange or uh, some other form of exchange. So here, if you want this J, comes from the fact that you can have virtual hopping and then the particle exchange and J is of the order of T square where T is the kinetic energy divided by U where U is the on-site propulsion and in the literature this is what is commonly referred to as super exchange. The standard exchange is usually dipole-dipole interaction but you're perfectly right this is a simple spin-spin interaction, but again, the microscopic origin of this J is in the kinetic energy and the Pauli principle uh, rather than the direct, uh, real moment-moment uh, interaction. That's why the name. But you can ignore the super if you don't want it and call it an exchange of intelligence. There is no problem with it. Uh, are there other questions? By the way, don't hesitate to interrupt me at any time if something that I'm saying is not uh, clear. Okay, so... Uh, 
this quantum magnetism, uh, the analysis of this Heisenberg, or there are more complicated version, Hamiltonian, is in itself a very uh, interesting uh, branch of uh, physics. But I want just to point out that it has also another uh, application, which is the following. This Hamiltonian is extremely well controlled in the sense that we know very precisely what are the interactions. And essentially, it's well controlled because the charge degrees of freedom are not playing a role here. Only spin degrees of freedom are playing a role. Now, if I consider a problem in solid state physics, which is an itinerant quantum problem. So, uh, usually, it's a very complicated problem. You have a screen, long range Coulomb interaction with the charges. And usually, we are not able to solve these complicated problems. And we need to find simplified models, so-called Hubbard model, TJ model, and so on, where we usually replace the long-range screen Coulomb interaction by some local interaction. Um, because these are the models we are able to solve. And one example of such simplification is, for example, the high TC. Uh, <clears throat> I don't want to talk about high TC. But just to point out that one has to go from this, which is the experimental phase diagram, where there are three bands in the, or, or there are copper, oxygen, three bands in the system, long range screen Coulomb interaction between the charges, to a simplified model where you need to retain only the minimum ingredients you are able to solve. And usually people take a Hubbard like Hamiltonian or a three band model with only on site interaction on copper, on oxygen, and so on and so on. And there you have a problem, which is you never know, in a way, whether the results you get out of these simplified models is uh, corresponding to the real physics of the problem because you use an oversimplified approximation to solve your simplified model or whether it's something which is contained in the model itself. For example, people are still fighting to know whether the Hubble model has a reasonable transition temperature towards a superconducting phase in two dimensions. And there are conflicting results on that. And unfortunately, the numerics is not yet able to really answer completely this question. Because simulating, and I'm sure Matthias or maybe he will say a word about this, but simulating fermionic system on a computer suffers from intrinsic limitations, which are called the sign problem. And it's an extremely tough uh, question. So uh, we are uh, facing the fact that to deal with itinerant quantum systems, we are not really able to deal, uh, to solve these models. And we would like to have uh, some computer or some system which help us uh, in a controlled way to solve this very complicated problem. There are two ways uh, people have tried to go around this complicated, three ways. One is to improve the numerical algorithms, the numerical techniques, and that's certainly uh, one very efficient route. The second one is to find real experiments with controlled systems for which these models are not simplifications of the real experimental system, but are the real description of the experiment. And then we can use these experimental situations as quantum simulators, as analog simulators, as analog computers, which will tell us, I have this Hamiltonian, I do this measurement on the experiment, and that's the answer for this Hamiltonian. And there are the most common route that you know for that is cold atoms, and perhaps Vincent will explain uh, in more detail uh, on cold atoms. But uh, cold atoms are a very nice realization of systems with short range interaction, and people have tried to simulate the Hubbard model or other related model. What I want to show you is that this uh, quantum systems, this quantum spin system, this localized spin system, can also be used as control realization of some itinerant model systems. And one can use them as, quote, quantum simulators to tackle some issues pertinent to itinerant quantum systems. And uh, the, the basic idea behind that is the fact that you can represent a spin and this is something which is known a long time ago in the work of Holstein, Primakov, Matsubara, and, and Matsuda, by a simple bosons, where you say, if my spin is up, I have no boson. If my spin is down, I have one boson. And in order to restrict the corresponding Hilbert space, 
you have to uh, implement a hardcore constraint saying you cannot put two bosons on the same side. And then this mapping where you say the S plus operator is B dagger, the creation of bosons, and SZ is just measuring the number of bosons, uh, is an exact mapping. The Eisenberg Hamiltonian, which I have rewritten here in that way, uh, with a term which is S plus, S minus, which is the exchange term, and SZ, SZ, which is the um, uh, near stable uh, exchange for the Z term, can be rewritten in the boson language as a kinetic energy for the bosons, and then some nearest neighbor interaction between the bosons. If you want to implement the constraint, you can also put a local repulsion here, a term like this, which will enforce that if U is going to infinity, you cannot put two bosons on the same side. So this nice Eisenberg model is a very, very controlled and nice realization of a model of bosons hopping on a lattice with an on-site repulsion, which is infinitely large, and a nearest neighbor interaction uh, between uh, two bosons on the same side. So we can use, in principle, this uh, spin system to study the physics of interacting bosons on a lattice. The yeah. nice thing is that... Yes, sorry? The fact that you put it infinite in the function, it's not really infinite in the practice. <coughs> that would induce another super exchange in the mm -hmm. language. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you renormalize the, the Hamiltonian, then you go in a vicious cycle because... No, 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 no. So for the spins... No, no, sorry, just to interrupt. So for the spins, the interaction is infinite. No, I understand, but if you go to the second Hamiltonian, where you have the U there, you practice U, it will be... Sure, finite. but if you take... But, okay. but then with finite, you'll get again an exchange. So if the U finite bothers you, just let me say that I am simulating, quote, hardcore bosons. If U is 20 times all the other parameters, in practice, doesn't matter. So if U is not infinite, but is much larger than J and, yeah, and the other... But then if it's 20 times bigger, then you have numerical problems if you do it numerically. No, no, but I don't want to do it numerically. Yeah. What I want to but do... It's not 20, you see, so if it's... If no, 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 I don't want... No, no, sorry, I wasn't case. clear. What I want to do is the following. I want to take an experimental system, which is a realization of my Eisenberg model, I will show you in a minute, and then use this system to do measurements on the system, and this measurement will give me the answer for this Hamiltonian. So I don't want to, you to do a numerical calculation with this Hamiltonian. I want to do connect this Hamiltonian to an experimental situation. Maybe it will become clearer, okay. a little bit clearer. Uh, with the, uh, OK, so the nice thing is that you can use the magnetic field as a chemical potential, because if you couple a magnetic field to your system, you're controlling the number of bosons. And you can measure the, uh, the uh, number of bosons by just measuring the magnetization in the system, which is a relatively easy thing to do. So it looked like a very nice mapping, but it was not really used or acted upon, and there are very good reasons for that. The reason is that usually the super exchange J is quite large, corresponds to thousands of Kelvin in a realistic uh, most uh, quantum uh, magnetic system, 500, 600 Kelvin, which means if you want to manipulate the spin, you usually would have to apply fields of 500 Tesla, which is not very uh, useful. But more importantly, if you have spins, uh, isolated spins, you have a lot of parasitic forces like dipolar interaction between the spins, which spoil this uh, nice mapping uh, to this very simple Eisenberg uh, model. But the situation uh, was uh, very, very uh, much better if instead of dealing with isolated spins, you are now dealing with dimer systems or S equal 1 system, and that's what I would like to describe to you. And I want just to show you two examples of application. One is the Bosenstein condensation, which is uh, for D equal 3 or D equal 2 systems. And the other one is the application to Luttinger liquids, which is the physics you will get in one-dimensional interacting systems of bosons or fermions, and this is something you get in D equal. So what happens if you have dimers? So let me assume that I have a system with uh, dimers, which means the exchange here on the yellow bonds is larger than the exchange on the white bonds. Then you have two spin one half, they are coupled, they go to a single state, and if j was <coughs> this, this, uh, the, the, the white j here is, is zero, then you get a couple of totally decoupled dimers, 
and you know the energy of this, you get a singlet state, which has the lowest energy, and three degenerate triplet states, which are higher in energy. Now, if I put a small j on the top of this uh, uh, couple dimer system, uh, uncoupled dimer system, because the ground state is separated by a gap, it does nothing, essentially. My ground state is still made of uncoupled uh, singlets. But things change if I put a magnetic field, because if I put a magnetic field, the singlet is insensitive to the field, but the triplet will uh, split with one of the triplet, the one aligned with the magnetic field, getting lower in energy. So if uh, I had no j here, if uh, the, the, the yj was uh, zero, then I would just reach a critical value of the field where the triplet become lower than the singlet, and the whole uh, system would just polarize. But of course, this is not uh, true, um, because the uh, spins are able to exchange with this uh, yj, and therefore, what I have is that if I have created a triplet on one of the rung, the triplet can, by exchange, move to another rung. So this leads uh, here to a dispersion relation for this lower triplet, which means that its energy is not a single value, but it depends on the hopping of this triplet from one uh, side to the next. And as a result, instead of having one transition where the triplet become lower than the singlet, you see that I will have two critical points here. One, when the first triplet with the lowest quantum number become lower than the singlet, this is where I start polarizing my system, and one where the last, uh, essentially, triplet is able to enter the system, and then I fully polarize my system. What is nice is that the mapping I showed you, the Einstein primakov mapping that existed with isolated spins, you can still do with uh, this singlet triplet, where you say, if I have a singlet on one rung, I have the absence of a boson. If I have a triplet on the rung, I have the presence of a boson. So I can still use this mapping uh, with this uh, dimer uh, Hamilton. So uh, what do I get if I plot the magnetization versus magnetic field? If I didn't have dispersion uh, for the triplet, I would just get the transition I mentioned. Singlet is the most stable, and then the system fully polarizes. But if I have uh, the exchange between the, the dimers, then I get the first critical field where some triplets start to enter the system. As I increase the field, I polarize more and more my system. And then every uh, rung is polarized at this second field. And I have now a uh, magnetization that cannot increase anymore. So you see that I have a system which has two quantum phase transition, one where the first triplet enter the system, and one where, uh, if you want, the last triplet is able to enter the system. And of course, the question is, what is the critical behavior here? What is the nature of the intermediate phase? And so on and so on. And, are, yes? are those triplets localized? Or are they no, no, no. Around? They are, of course, itinerant, which is why they have a dispersion. So think of it as a boson here that can hop on the next side. Uh, the bosons are interacting, but let's forget the interaction for the moment. It's like bosons on a square lattice. So there is a cosine k uh, type dispersion, a type binding dispersion, which is giving this width here for the, the triplet. So here, the first triplet which will enter is a k equals zero triplet. And then little by little, I'm kind of filling a band of triplet uh, until the last triplet is able to enter the system. But it's, so the bandwidth will be very big, right? Gives the lifetime very short. So the bandwidth is given by this J here. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, the, the, uh, so the lifetime is very short, right? Well, they are interacting particles. Right, so, so of course, uh, the question is, what do I get? And I come uh, to that in a moment. So, of course, this vision of non-interacting bosons is, is completely wrong. Mm -hmm. These are hardcore bosons. They are strongly interacting. And one should take this interaction into account. Yes? Is JR yellow bonds? Yeah, JR is the yellow. Yes, exactly. And J uh, is the rung, is the is the white one. So here I assume that JR is larger than, than J, so I can start with my isolated uh, dimers. Are there other questions? Can I be sure that this critical point is not a zero edge? Yes, that you can be sure of because uh, if you apply a small uh, perturbation here, if you're in this limit. Uh, you can check that the ground state is indeed made of uh, um, essentially isolated 
uh, oh, not isolated, but it's made essentially of dimers. So I will even show you data, so I hope it will come this. Yes. But it's a calculation that shows that. Yeah, you can, you can check that there is a finite gap here, which even survives to a finite magnetic field. So there is no question. If you want, if you want to inject the first triplet, look at it when j here is zero. If you want to inject the first triplet, you need to have a magnetic field which is able to compensate for this gap. So it's clear that you need to go here to a uh, uh, field H, which is of the order of J right. Now, if J is small, you will broaden this by a quantity of order J, but you will not be able to reach zero. And again, it's fully supported both by experiment and calculation. Yes. yes. Could, you, could you please switch half of the light? I the can switch everything. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's, it's probably better. the best. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let me uh, again show this curve. And now the question is, what is this transition about? Now, uh, this is something we studied some time ago with Alexei Tsvelik. And if you think about it, it's relatively uh, obvious, but apparently uh, people didn't uh, think before about it. And essentially, uh, this transition here, which I showed in the temperature versus magnetic field phase diagram, so here is my phase where I get the singlet, is in the universality class of Bose-Einstein condensation. And in the spin language, what does the Bose-Einstein condensation mean? So you see I have this mapping. I can represent my spins as bosons. I have interacting bosons. When I am here, the number of bosons is very weak. So if I have bosons, I lower the temperature. It's quite natural to think that they can get and can go to a Bose-Einstein condensate. Now, what does it mean in the spin language? In the spin language, I have applied the magnetic field, but I still have my spin, which are free to rotate around the direction of the magnetic field. So I can have a phase where the angle inside the plane perpendicular to the magnetic field is not fixed, or I can have a phase where all the spin lock into a certain angle, and this angle is nothing but the phase of the boson. So the Bose-Einstein condensation, where the phase of the boson becomes a real number, corresponds to antiferromagnetic ordering for my spins in the plane perpendicular to the magnetic field. So essentially, you have two phases here. One phase where the uh, magnetization, the staggered magnetization, in the plane perpendicular to the magnetic field is zero. But if you lower the temperature, then you have a phase where the spin orders in the plane perpendicular to the magnetic field. So this is something which is relatively easy to measure, quote, uh, and uh, tells you that you have a phase transition, a quantum phase transition, or phase transition here, uh, that, uh, as I said, is essentially a Bose-Einstein condensation. Why is it useful? Because when you are close to the critical point here, you can sort of forget about the interactions between the bosons in first approximation because they are very diluted. You have very few of them. So you can very well describe the critical behavior here by nearly free bosons, and you can use the whole knowledge of the Bose-Einstein condensation to describe this transition. So for example, the TC here you can show is simply H minus HC to the power 2 over D, where D is the space dimension. Uh, you can make other uh, predictions directly borrowed from uh, essentially uh, the knowledge of Bose-Einstein condensation. For example, that the magnetization, the density of bosons, as a function of temperature, is a non-monotonous function. So when I lower the temperature, the magnetization, the density of bosons, if you prefer, decreases with temperature. But when you hit TC, when you hit the Bose-Einstein condensate, it starts growing up again, which is a very non-intuitive behavior for the spins. But again, for the bosons, it's quite natural. Uh, you can study, for example, the NMR relaxation rate, which is the boson-boson correlation function. But essentially, for the moment, I want you just to remember these two uh, objects. One is that the TC will go as H minus HC to some power. And the second one is that the magnetization is a non-monotonous function. And lo and behold, uh, this uh, is something that has been checked into the experiments. Uh, there is a nice compound, which is thallium copper chloride, on which experiments were done by Nikuni and collaborators. Uh, and this were the first uh, real uh, check of these uh, predictions we made with Alexei, uh, where you see here the phase diagram, temperature versus magnetic field. 
you see a kind of critical behavior. Here would be a fit to the uh, two-third uh, power. Uh, so the, the data point seems at least consistent with that. But what is quite spectacular is the uh, cusp in the magnetization, where here is the magnetization as a function of temperature. And you see the magnetization going down and at some temperature uh, going up again in full agreement with the Bosenstein uh, condensation prediction. After this experiment came very beautiful uh, neutron experiment from Christian Rieg and collaborators, which showed direct measurement of the excitation spectrum. So here is measurement of the splitting of the triplet that I mentioned before. Uh, here is a, a more complete data where you see, so this is an answer to your question, here is the uh, excitation spectrum directly measured by the neutrons as a function of the field strength. You see clearly the triplet splitting here as a function of the magnetic field, and you see here the critical field you need to close the gap. Yes? Can you get the same exponents at the other yes. high field? Yes. So uh, essentially, uh, you have uh, within this uh, simplified picture, you have a particle hole symmetry if you want, and you get the same exponent at the other field. The other field is, of course, more difficult to access because it's higher. It has nice feature, though, uh, because the saturated phase is very simple. It's really everybody is saturated. The singlet phase is a little bit more. Is it, is it accessible? Experiment? It depends on the compound. It depends on the compound. But for several compounds, you will see, yes, this is, uh, this is excessive. Can okay, you, yeah? Question? Uh, so, I mean, it's a very beautiful like, comparison between the boson language and the, uh, yes. like, a, uh, the you know, spin language is like an XY plane, mm -hmm. it spins over in, in, in another plane. Uh, <coughs> but if I think the critical point is the uh, described by the order parameter of the condensate, yes. where, like I say, the condensate, condensate fraction goes uh, kind of uh, to some power T minus TC, or mm -hmm. T is like T H minus HC, right? Yes. But usually in the boson, in the, bo in the BEC case, it's usually the, it, the system, I mean, the curve was saturated by, say, uh, the ratio of the condensate over the total particle number is one. Here, the total particle number is corresponding to the total magnetization, which is zero, which is MZ, right? Yes. So how does this, I, I can figure out how, uh, how this, the curve goes near the critical point, but eventually it was saturated at some point? Yeah, so what, what I, I'm, so not sure I, I'm not sure I, answer your, I, I understand your question. So the point is the following, that here, yeah, you're perfectly right, rho is the total particle number. Right. Okay, so the, 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 the magnetization is the total particle number. So then there is a condensate fraction here, which is proportional to the distance to the critical point. Right. So at the critical point, at the quantum critical point, this fraction goes to zero. So if I were uh, moving, if I was moving right here, the magnetization would simply go to zero as a power law of the temperature. Right. So there is no uh, inconsistency. So here, the magnetization goes to zero as a power law of the temperature. Here, the magnetization goes to zero as a power law of the temperature. Okay. Here, the magnet. Sorry, maybe this is the point. I'm talking now about the magnetization along the direction of the field. <laughs> Okay? Not the other <coughs> parameter, which is the magnetization perpendicular to the direction. So eventually this will be, but the total particle number now is interpreted as the uh, MMZ, right? Yes. Which is zero. But in the post condensate case, total particle number is not zero. It's zero only here. It's not zero here. No, no, no. For the long, for the, uh, long condensed particle. No, 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 no. The other parameter is the magnetization perpendicular to the magnetic field. <coughs> and this is the antiferromagnetic order in the plane. So this one is indeed zero here, non zero here. But there is another magnetization, which is the magnetization <laughs> along the direction of the field, which is mapped to the total number of bosons. This one is non zero at any finite temperature for any field. But when the temperature goes to zero, it becomes zero here, yeah. but is non zero in all this phase. And that's the curve which uh, I showed here, the experimental curve that I showed here. And you see that the closer you go to the critical field, the more this magnetization decreases, as it should, because if you go in the gap phase, the magnetization along the direction of the field should be zero. Measuring the staggered magnetization is, of course, much more difficult because you need a local probe. You need neutron scattering, and you cannot do it by a thermodynamic measurement. But this is already... Uh, an indication of the Bose-Einstein condensation with this non-monotonic non behavior. 
The staggered magnetization was measured by the neutron scattering experiment. I will show you data for another compound. And one thing which was measured, which I show here, is the dispersion, the energy, versus momentum of the modes that exist in the condensed phase. And you know you should get a Goldstone mode. You know you should get a mode whose energy is proportional to K. And this is what you observe directly here in neutron scattering experiment. You do find the Goldstone mode that you expect for a Bose-Einstein mm -hmm. condensate. Goldstone Magnon mode. You can so call it a Magnon mode. You can say about Bose condensation of Magnon. Yes. And number of your particles is number of Magnon. The number of the particles is... No. Because the magnons are corresponding to the transverse direction, and the number of particles is the magnetization along the direction of the field. But magnetization, this magnon also brings some uh, perpendicular magnetization. No, no, there is one which is the magnetization perpendicular to the field, which is the staggered magnetization, which is the other parameter, and one which is the magnetization along the field. So it is not usual magnon. It's not. Exactly the standard magnet. Because the magnet magnet with target magnetization, they also have component perpendicular to them. Yes, but I, I think it's... Second order. Uh, okay, maybe we should discuss, but I think it's not the same. Uh, it's not what you have in mind for the standard magnet condensation. But okay, let's... let's it is not standard there. magnet. Sorry? It is not standard I don't think so. Yeah. Yes. Can I just ask a clarifying question? Do I understand it correctly that to describe the... Uh, the magnetization, you can use the model of non-interacting bosons. No. Well, X, y, uh, no. X, y, because if you use... No, 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 no. Especially to describe the magnetization along Z, you have to keep the interaction. Otherwise, uh, essentially, your bosons would all go into the same state, and you would be dead. But essentially, the fact that you get a hardcore constraint <coughs> is just limiting the number of bosons. And then, for the rest, you can use nearly free bosons. But it's um, very important that there is the repulsion between the bosons. But that equation you have for t equals 3 halves, mm -hmm. uh, that's non interaction That's what I'm saying. If you want to relate the chemical potential to the number of particles, you have to keep the interaction into account. But once you have done that, you can essentially throw away the interaction. So, you, you know, standard Bose-Einstein condensation, people tell you, you can only get it if the number of particles is fixed. That's not true. You can get it even if you fix the chemical potential, but here, you don't want your particle to sort of go away, or the, your chemical potential here is within the band. And you can only get that because you get extremely large repulsion between the particles. So, so you, you, need the, you need the repulsion so that you get a nice relation between the chemical potential and the number of particles. And that's essentially the only place very close to the critical point where your repulsion is coming into account. So for specific heat, you see alphas. Yeah. Zero rather than minus one. Yeah. So, uh, well, again, I can explain in more details, but, but if you were dealing with free bosons, you would run into terrible problems when H is larger than HC1 because you would try to put the chemical potential inside the dispersion band of the bosons with, with a pure Bose statistics will give you horrible divergences. I mean, you, you would be really in bad shape. But, but again, Think about the, 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 the bosons as particles which cannot be two in the same state. So you cannot feel more than a certain number of this particle for a given chemical potential. But then once you have done that, you can ignore the interaction. I, I hope it answers the question. Are there other questions? Okay. So just to say that this Goldstone mode uh, has been measured. There are other examples, uh, some work, uh, very nice work done by the group in Los Alamos on a compound called hen purple, which showed here a linear uh, slope. And the interpretation is that this is a layered system with some frustration in the hopping. So essentially, what you see is two-dimensional systems. And there, the exponent should be 2 over d, 2 over 2. And this corresponds indeed to something which is uh, linear, uh, close to the quantum critical point. And this started uh, okay, many, many other theoretical work and experimental work that I don't have time to, to mention. I just want to point out the comparison with, uh, between these uh, quantum simulators made of spin to study interacting bosons and the one uh, in cold atoms. 
they are, uh, you can make uh, mapping uh, or there are uh, similarities. The particles is corresp are corresponding to the spin excitation. The boson number is the spin component and so on and so forth. The charge conservation that you get here is the rotational invariance and so on and so forth. And these are two complementary systems. And uh, if you want to know more, we have written a little review uh, in uh, Nature Physics that you can uh, consult for having more reference and more uh, details uh, on the thing. But I just want to point out that the spins and the coal atoms are complementary uh, to study these questions. The coal atoms have much more control on the lattice and the parameter. They have perfect short-range interaction, but they suffer from inhomogeneities. They are confined into a trap, and this trap makes the density inhomogeneous, which makes it difficult, for example, to study critical points. Some of the probes are uh, difficult uh, some of the quantities are difficult to probe, but this is a situation which is rapidly evolving. The VEC, you have to take uh, what your uh, chemist friend gives you as far as an experimental compound, but usually they are extremely homogeneous and you have an extremely good density control because you can change the magnetic field and change the number of bosons and measure the number of bosons. And uh, you have pretty good probes. There are 60 years of history in probing quantum uh, magnets with neutrons and MR, uh, ESR, and so on. But, of course, as I said, everything is fixed by the chemistry of the compound. So if you don't have a good chemist friend which can make the compound of your dream, forget it. You will not be able to simulate uh, the model that you like. I showed you that already in D equal 3, D equal 2, there are pretty good uh, systems to do that. I just want to give you one example. This is sort of checking that these systems can give Bose-Einstein condensation. I just want to give you one example uh, of the type of physics one can explore. And uh, this uh, is the physics of disordered bosons, because you can disorder these magnetic systems. And then you can try to study the Bose glass phase, which is a phase corresponding to uh, bosons in a random potential. What is a Bose glass? It's a, and here is the experimental paper with, whose data I will show in a second. What is a Bose glass? A Bose glass is a system which is made of bosons plus disorder. And because of the disorder, the bosons have lost their superfluid order parameter. So the system is non-superfluid, but it's still compressible. It's not a mott insulator of bosons. So if you try to add bosons, you have a finite compressibility. So you want to be able to measure the compressibility dm dh here for the spin system, dn d mu for the bosons, and you want to be able to measure the superfluid order parameter, which in the spin language is the staggered magnetization perpendicular to the field. And that's something you can do relatively easily on a spin <coughs> system, and here is the experimental data. Here is a plot of the magnetization versus magnetic field. Here. This is the pristine sample. Yes? So I saw it um still try to figure out, this should be like S, I mean S plus. This is the average of S plus plus S minus, if you want, yeah. Uh, so it's the average of psi plus psi dagger. So should I think like S plus corresponding to psi dagger? Yeah, essentially. Uh, yeah, S plus is B dagger, yeah, it's psi dagger. Uh, and, and actually, what says, I was still thinking about, what says the, uh, in the condensate language of bosons, mm -hmm. what says the uh, <coughs> ghost of mode, uh, Velocity. Usually that is this is the exchange, J. This is the exchange. This is the super density associated with the boson. And this is a combination of the exchange J and, of course, the superfluid density. Mm -hmm. So, of course, if there were no exchange between the particle, you would not get any, any boson. Corresponding to mz in the spin language, but the this is the total density. This is the total density. <coughs> this is uh, not the uh, condensate. Okay. okay, maybe we can discuss uh, that. Yes. Okay. yes. Okay. When you were making the, the analogy to the uh, to the, the at cold atom systems, yes, if you could rotate your system or something like it, can you get vortices in? Oh, you mean with the spins? Uh, yeah, sure. Potentially, you can get vortices, but rotating the spin system yeah, is uh, not a simple mean, idea. Yeah. I would love, for example, to see spin transport experiments, and potentially this can be done. I mean, you know, this is uh, pushing this analogy to measuring other things can be done. For the moment, what has been measured is essentially uh, the basic characteristics of Bose-Einstein condensation. Now there is a program on disorder that is kind of starting. Uh, I'm sure, you know, one can push this uh, further, but measuring vortices in spin systems and things like this has not been done for the moment. It's not so easy. 
Yes, there was a so question. It, um, is it also, it would be probably also interesting to measure the local transfer susceptibility, which is, should, should be divergent. Yeah. Um, probably with some impurities or response to impurities? With, with neutrons, you can, in principle, do that. But not lo <coughs> is it local, then it's... Uh, no, 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 you measure the Q and omega response. Oh, okay. So you, you can, can in principle... A, uh, local yeah, the neutrons can measure the S of Q and omega, which is S plus Q and omega, S minus Q and omega. So it can, in principle, measure the correlation. It's slightly more complicated than measuring the other okay, parameter. Focus on the transverse direction, then it would have to be polarized uh, neutrons. Or uh, you can do it. You can do it with polarized neutrons. Uh, you can also do it with unpolarized and extract oh, the component the, the because the rest, the rest is uh, yeah, the rest is quite yeah. regular, so you don't have problems. If you want to do it with polarized neutron, you lose a lot in, in intensity. Yeah. So that's a trade-off. Between a quite simple interpretation of the data and the fact that uh, the data become more crumbled. I just like on maybe some trivial point: the size of the fluid order parameter can dance as Q equals zero. Yeah, but you keep referring to the staggered yes. organization. So there is a gauge transformation you should do, which uh, makes that you multiply on each uh, every two sides the S plus by minus one to the I. Uh, so if you are in a bipartite lattice, you can do this gauge transformation. And then the uh, Q equal pi order parameter is mapped onto the Q equal zero uh, okay, so then, condensation. So if I want to carry this forward and say that okay, I want to measure not the Boston mode above the condensate, but mm -hmm. I want to measure mm -hmm. the condensate fraction, mm -hmm. like it's done in helium 4. Yes. Would be, what would be the analog of this measurement for the, for the spin system? The condensate fraction, I think, is the uh, average of S plus, yes. of the staggered part of S plus. That is so it's, it's it should be elastic, right? It should be elastic. Yeah, yeah. So this is elastic. Uh, you, I mean, that, that's here. This is the peak intensity in elastic neutron scattering at Q equal pi. Right. So, the, 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 the so that's the Spin stiffness would be the, yeah. the superfluid. Yeah, spin stiffness is essentially the superfluid density. Yes. Are there other questions on that? <coughs> okay. So here is the plot of the pure system, so the system without disorder. You see, the nice thing here is that this is an horrible organic compound, and when you make disorder in this uh, substituting essentially chlorine by bromine, what you disorder is the exchange path between two spins. So you're changing locally the exchange a little bit, uh, but you're not removing a spin, making zinc, so copper substituted by zinc or something like this which is really a very, very strong disorder. So this is relatively weak disorder. Here is the curve magnetization versus uh, magnetic field, where for the pure system, you see that there is a kind of transition here, where the system then starts to enter uh, the uh, phase where uh, there are bosons. Uh, here is the same curve for the disordered system. Uh, and you see, if you uh, make the numerical derivative of this curve, that the compressibility is roughly uh, constant here, uh, starting from this point. So the compressibility is dmdh here, and you see that starting from here, you have particle in the system, and you have a finite compressibility. Now, measurement of the peak intensity seems to show that here, you get no superfluid order parameter, but that the superfluid order parameter starts at a larger uh, value of the magnetic <coughs> field. So potentially, this regime here is a regime where you get compressible uh, system of bosons, uh, and you get no superfluidity. So it's a potential candidate for this both glass phase. Of course, uh, this is the first experiment on the subject. It doesn't claim to be the ultimate answer. But this is, I would say, a very good uh, step in the direction of uh, being able to probe the physics uh, of this post glass phase. And as you see, this is a compound on which, uh, this is a direction in which measuring both the finite compressibility and measuring the superfluid order parameter are possible, and you do not suffer from inhomogeneity. So it's certainly uh, an extremely interesting route and complementary to the one that is followed act very actively at the moment and with also a very interesting results in the cold atom uh, direction. So I just wanted to advocate uh, this uh, for um, uh, study of uh, interacting bosons. 
I think uh, I've spent uh, more than my time uh, on the, the physics of uh, 2D and 3D, so I will just skip uh, the part that I wanted to uh, tell you about 1D. I just want to show you that in 1D, uh, just to finish, I just want to show you that in 1D, we have now a very powerful numerical method to study the uh, time-dependent dynamics which is something which did not exist a couple of years ago. Uh, people had to use uh, Quantum Monte Carlo, but then they had problems with Quantum Monte Carlo going back to real-time dynamics. Now, thanks to the developments that happened in uh, DMRG method, uh, density matrix renormalization group method, we are able to directly compute in 1D, and you will find more details in this uh, paper, uh, the uh, full spin-spin uh, correlation as a function of Q and omega, and I'll just flash the example, we can discuss more in detail the physics. So what is computed here is the S plus S minus correlation uh, as a function of Q along, so this is a system of ladders, a system made of two couple chains. So this is Q along the direction of the chain, omega is the frequency, and QY is the momentum perpendicular to the chains, because there are only two chains, uh, this momentum can take two values, q equals zero, q equals pi, and here are the two correlation functions. This is in the absence of magnetic field. What you see here is the triplet dispersion corresponding to this point, which is dispersing with q as a cosine, as we were discussing. It's like a tight binding dispersion. You see that the uh, q equals zero uh, correlation here is much more complicated. I don't want to enter into the detail for this correlation. I don't have uh, time for that. But just to show you that now we are able to uh, follow and uh, compute for uh, essentially all values of the magnetic field this uh, dispersion relation. Here is uh, how the spectrum uh, evolves. And we can even do comparison, extremely good comparison, with the neutron scattering spectrum, which has been measured on a compound, which is an excellent realization of this uh, uh, ladder system. I think I will uh, stop here. Uh, I just want, uh, wanted to show you that localized spin system uh, have, uh, can be used as uh, quantum simulators, if you want, for itinerant quantum systems. That using dimers has several advantages. Uh, we can, uh, they are less sensitive to parasitic dipolar forces and so on and so forth. We can uh, use them to describe very well Bose-Einstein condensation in d equal 3, uh, d equal 2. Uh, I didn't discuss this point, but I just want to make the advertisement that uh, if we do the same study in D equal 1, this is a fantastic system to quantitatively test a theory, which is the theory of interacting particle in one dimension, which is called the Tomonaga uh, Luttinger liquid. And this uh, experimental system allowed to uh, get quantitative agreement with uh, theoretical prediction of Tomonaga Luttinger liquid, which is to, my, to the best of my knowledge, the first quantitative test of these predictions. Uh, and now we have a good uh, quantitative description uh, of the dynamics in one dimension. There are a lot of perspectives. We still need to understand uh, much better what happens to the quantum critical points, especially uh, in uh, uh, 1D systems or quasi-1D systems. Uh, we need to compute the, the dynamical quantity in the quantum critical regime. Uh, for which uh, our 1D uh, theory is not uh, sufficient. And finally, uh, we need to apply the same uh, type of analysis to other materials. I showed you that there is a very, very interesting route by adding impurities in the system, and perhaps uh, at some point when we'll be able to go back to reintroducing the charge degrees of freedom and study the dog system. And on that, I will stop, and thank you for your attention. Sorry, I'm jumping again about semantic. Okay, so it is very difficult to agree about semantic. It's a matter of taste in any case. So I don't argue about this. You call it Bose Einstein condensation. Uh -huh. So I try to follow your recipe for semantic. You call it Alstow mode, and you have some phenomena which you call Bose Einstein condensation. And I go further. Yeah, suppose. Also, mode, in fact, it is uh, sometimes in solid state physics called soft mode. Mm -hmm. 
Suppose you have structure phase transition, yes. which is described also by soft mode. Can you call this phenomena also from your uh, concept of a positive condensation of phonons? Yes. Because it's the same story. I would, I would use the same And then you are, uh, have no restriction for this stem, and because the Einstein condensation can appear everywhere where you have soft mode. Because, I, okay. you see, it is boson operator. Yes. So, I, as you said, it's mostly a question of semantic. Yes. And uh, for that, in the review, I could not resist putting a quotation from Shakespeare, which says, what's in a name, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Yeah, uh, I, I remember. And, your, and, uh, uh, <coughs> I read so, if you don't like Bosenstein condensation, I, I will not argue on that. But to answer your question, yes, if there is uh, a structural transition, I would also, in a way, call it uh, uh, a Bosenstein condensation of phonon. Yes. Okay. Uh, here, again, the mapping between the spins and the bosons is so direct that I think it would be. A mistake not to call it Bose-Einstein condensation. The spins are hardcore bosons. But again, the hardcore part is important. Otherwise, you could not get the transition by controlling the magnetic field, by controlling the chemical potential. You would be in trouble with real bosons without interaction. So actually, I, feel, I still follow the ball, and it's very really <coughs> difficult question to understand. Uh, but I, so what's my understanding is like uh, the symmetry. Because they have this U1 symmetry, yes. which is common in two languages. Yes. But somehow it's very different because your both condensate is actually corresponding to the uh, a U1 symmetry, which is broken associated with the total particle number. No, 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 no. no that's not put my in the magnetization. No, no, that's exactly the point. So you have mm -hmm. a system which is which has, of course, a U2 symmetry initially. But, you but when you apply, theory. wait, wait. But when you apply the magnetic field, the magnetic field polarizes the spin. And the only symmetry that remains is the symmetry perpendicular right. to the magnetic field, so which is a U1 symmetry. Right. Somehow, the condensate is actually is not in the... No, the condensate is... It's not is part of the total particle bosons. It actually comes from a larger channel. The condensate the corresponds to the ordering mm -hmm. in the direction perpendicular to the field, which is indeed corresponding to a U1 symmetry. Right. And that's because you have the magnetic field that the symmetry uh, group, if you want, of your system is not U1. So, so it's different because you indeed have a conservation uh, of some kind of quantity, like the MZ. That's a, it's not like the condensate of photons. Because so it's different. No, 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 no. Again, I insist, the interactions are crucial. The fact that you get the interactions allows you to relate in a unique way the chemical potential and the number of particles, which is MZ. And it's a little bit the same in a Bose-Einstein condensation. The total number of particles is conserved. You do not change it when you go from the uncondensed to the condensed phase. So here, when I go from the uncondensed to the condensed phase, my magnetization is changing, but my uh, number, my chemical potential is constant. So in that sense, the temperature dependence of the quantity is not the same than in the canonical Bose-Einstein condensation, but essentially, all the mechanism is the same, the symmetry group is the same. I, I agree, it's a little gymnastic when uh, So, I mean, my point is fine. It, I, I think the ground state has no well defined MZ. Is that, is that correct? The ground state? If I, write, if I write down the ground state either in the spin or in the boson. Now, MZ in fact commutes with the Hamiltonian. So, yeah, it's so well defined. the ground state will break the symmetry in the sense it has no well defined MZ. Right? No, no, it has a well defined MZ oh, because it commutes with the Hamiltonian. So. I, we can discuss that. Yes? Can you just use the Penrose Bonsager definition for the BEC and then you don't have that problem? Uh, well, I mean, the, 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 I think what you refer to the Penrose Bonsager is that the psi, psi dagger will tend to a constant when the separation goes to infinity. Or just yes. the largest eigenvalue in single particle density. Yes, this, this, will, this will work in the sense that psi, psi dagger will indeed tend to a constant, which in, in, in this case, in the spin language, is SX. Sx separated by a large distance, which is another way to say that there is order in the plane perpendicular to the magnetic field. Yes. Since many of you have the dramatic change in time zones, I suppose that we take a coffee break for the first talk. Uh, for 10 minutes, 
So the, the rest of the outside and the next. Yes. Can you